Chinese doctor who sounded the alarm a novel coronavirus has died from the disease. The Chinese authorities have tried to control the information on the president and on the already heavily censored Chinese social media. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Among the media stories that we're covering this week, transparency, the managed kind. Beijing's approach to controlling the narrative on the coronavirus remains a work in progress. And trying to keep fear of the pandemic contained <coughs> in places like Germany. They're loud, they can bully, they call themselves nationalists, and they are some of India's most watched news anchors. Plus, the Duterte government in Manila, having gone after news websites it doesn't like, now targeting the country's biggest broadcaster. Two weeks ago, when we first examined the official Chinese response to the coronavirus outbreak, Beijing was in damage control mode. The government had been slow to respond, its media outlets had downplayed the seriousness of the threat, and lives were lost as a result. One of those deaths, a doctor in the frontline city of Wuhan, has caused collective outrage online. Li Wenliang was amongst the first to raise the alarm. He was then taken into custody and forced to confess to wrongdoing, rumor-mongering, for doing his job, essentially. It is rare for the Chinese to openly criticize their government, rarer still when those criticisms on social media are not instantly deleted by censors. However, for a brief period of time, that's what was happening online. For Chinese journalists, there was a temporary window that opened for some hard-hitting investigative reporting. It appears that window has closed again. The term that China watchers are now using to describe Beijing's approach to the coronavirus story is inherently oxymoronic. They call it managed transparency. Our starting point this week is Ground Zero, the city of Wuhan. Of all the casualties of this coronavirus, none has made more news in China than Dr. Li Wenliang. On December 30th, Li used a closed messaging group to tell colleagues of the seriousness of the strain. He said he did not intend the message to be shared, which it was. He was then taken into custody and forced to apologize for spreading rumors. Li contracted the virus, succumbing on February 7th and unleashing a wave of fury online, the likes of which the Chinese authorities seldom see or tolerate. Loads of China watchers, including myself, we, we would never see this coming. We already know that the public was angry about the handling of the virus and probably about the covering up of facts. But we wouldn't expect this kind of outpouring of anger towards the government to emerge online. People, remarkably, they also posted something like, uh, I want freedom of speech on Weibo, China's equivalent of Twitter. And then that hashtag was viewed more than 1.8 million times before it got deleted. When there are so many people feel so strongly about his death, it won't be wise for the authorities to really just like block all the comments. The state media, they do report on his death, but the language they use are mostly focusing on, you know, we have so much respect for this doctor for what he did as a doctor, not, not for what he did as a whistleblower. They're focusing on one part they want people to focus on about Dr. Li Wenliang, but not really on the part that people care about mostly about the freedom of speech. Citizens have taken the coronavirus story into their own hands and devices. That is the biggest single change since the SARS coronavirus story of 2003. The Chinese had internet access back then, but social media was not anything like the news source it is today. Chen Chioshi, a lawyer turned blogger, has documented the hospitals overloaded with patients. Fang Bin, who's in the clothing business, posted images of body bags destined for the crematorium. And then had his phone camera rolling when the authorities came calling. Both are now assumed to be in custody. But there are another 50 million people under quarantine, and they have a lot of time to tell their stories.
The social media role in covering this crisis has been truly unprecedented. It's been the first epidemic, the first major disease in China that's been truly televised. So whether you're stuck at home alone in Wuhan, um, not seeing any relatives or not being able to buy groceries, if you're a doctor fighting this disease in a hospital that's overcrowded, or if you're a patient who's struggling to get into the hospital, we're seeing those stories through social media. Anybody who's far away from Wuhan, including international observers, have been able to witness and even feel what it's like to be part of this epidemic. That's something that I think is truly um, moving. It's emotional, but it also puts a lot of pressure on state authorities at the local and central level to react, to beat this disease and to bring people together. It also exposes the country's primary news channels, which for weeks were providing far less information than social media was. Domestic news outlets, especially national channels and newspapers, have been state-controlled ever since the communists took power more than 70 years ago. There have been some temporary openings for more adventurous reporting, most recently during the time of the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Those freedoms were already dissipating by 2012, when Xi Jinping took power. By 2016, the president was touring media outlets demanding, in his words, their absolute loyalty to the party in thought, politics and action. On the coverage of the coronavirus, that is what the president got. Liu Xin hosts an opinion program at the state-funded channel CGTN. There's a fundamental um, premise that's wrong with this question saying that uh, the state media might have a different agenda in not reporting the truth of the story. Basically, when CCTV, the state media, in your words, interviewed one of the utmost experts in China on fighting the virus on the 20th of January, and Mr. Zhong Nanshan told people, that is when the public was alerted to the potential scale, to potential severity of this epidemic. So I don't think it is uh, anywhere the state media that was suppressing the severity of the situation. But the interview Liu Xin refers to on January 20th came more than three weeks after Dr. Li Wenliang had put the word out. It was old news. There has been some first-rate journalism produced by Chinese news outlets, just not on national television and not for long. The Tsai Xin Media Group specializes in periodicals and online content. The Economist magazine has called Tsai Xin the rarest of things in China, a courageous media outlet pursuing the truth in the face of intimidation. They produce probably the best coverage about coronavirus so far. So they had this like four parts coverage about the virus and it reveals how the virus unfolded in Wuhan and how the government probably has covered up some of the facts about the virus and delayed the reporting of the virus leading to the public crisis we say now. And that was quite remarkable to do such heart-hating coverage because usually they would be subject to heavy censorship. But the freedom Tsai Xin had to do that reporting would prove temporary. By early February, the window for most of that kind of journalism had slammed shut. The Chinese media have since shifted their focus to the positive side of the story. Doctors, officials and aid workers all described in heroic terms. The standard for that kind of messaging, the emphasis on the collective response over the search for accountability is set by state-controlled channels like CGTN and CCTV. Almost every report, if you open Chinese you know, news portals, you'll see it's mostly positive reports celebrating the heroes of the virus, uh, the medical professionals, the officials who are fighting it, the public itself. Here we are, you know, together, and every Chinese person has to fight, and we're there for the nation. And of course, President Xi himself has appeared in the limelight of the media for the first time since the outbreak of the crisis. He visited a local residential area in Beijing. He was, he was wearing a mask and he was talking to the local people and people were responding very actively, in high spirit, I would say. <laughs> that piece of video I noticed was watched um, almost uh, 15 million times and got over 200,000 thumbs up. So I think people in general responded well to his message that he um, is there. 
you know, with the people, being with the masses, and showing his leadership. Xi Jinping went to this hospital in Beijing, and he video chatted with uh, doctors from Wuhan. But one thing we have to note is that Xi Jinping has never set a foot in Wuhan so far. But what we really want is to really know what the central government has in plan to really cure the disease, to really address the issue, to really respond to people's demands for freedom of speech. But I think those core questions, they probably will never get answered. We're discussing another media story that's come across our radar this week with Maria Ressa, a Filipina journalist who runs one of the country's most popular news websites, Rappler. Maria, thanks for joining us here at The Listening Post thanks today. For having it's always me. nice to see you. This past week, the Solicitor General in Manila moved to shut down the country's leading broadcast news outlet, ABS CBN, which, like your Rappler has been a vocal critic of President Duterte's so-called war on drugs. Can you walk us through the case that the prosecutors are making against ABS CBN? All right, here are the, the basis of it. Uh, the Office of the Solicitor General says that, that there's this obscure legal term, quo waranto, that they should never have been given a franchise in the first place because of violations. Uh, because they charged for television. And then the second one is because they have something similar to what Rappler has, Philippine depository receipts that allow foreign control. Mm. Uh, both of those have been taken up in different ways and have been shown by legal experts to be flawed. Can you give us a little more detail on these PDRs? Because I know a lot of people who, from outside the Philippines, find them a little bit confounding. So media in the Philippines has to be 100% Filipino owned. But to deal with this, because it's not just media, other companies like telecommunications, infrastructure, mm. uh, they have foreign ownership restrictions. To be able to have foreign investors, a vehicle called PDRs, Philippine Depository Receipts, was created and is constitutionally recognized. A PDR does not give ownership over a share. It doesn't give a vote, it doesn't give any kind of control. What it does do is a foreign investor can come in and have economic returns. You beat the case. Uh, one reason for that was that your foreign investor, Pierre Omidyar, divested himself of the shares and I, I understand donated his shares to Filipino charities. Do you see any kind of possibility that ABS CBN could end up with a similar outcome, approach? I, I think we have to hold the line. PDRs are legal. In fact, in our Court of Appeals case, the Court of Appeals said they are legal. But that's not how you beat the case, is it? We haven't beaten the case yet. In 2018, I had 11 cases and investigations against me and Rappler. In 2019, I had to post bail eight times to be free. So these, these uh, cases are still ongoing. We did not get around it by having Pierre Omidyar donate. This is something that that they did because they wanted to remove, in their mind, remove it. They did this independently of Rappler. But I continue to challenge this. This is a point of law. So Duterte starts with the media, but you told me that you're seeing signs that this government is now going further, looking at other institutions and trying to perhaps capture some of them. Is, is it any coincidence that he started with the media? Not at all. You go back to the 1970s, and then you go back again to 1986. Anytime someone wants to take control of government, the first step is to control the media. That's the first step of Ferdinand Marcos in 1972. He shut down ABS-CBN and controlled it, took it over. Uh, in 1986, the People Power Revolt that, that got rid of Marcos, right, the first step was to take over the television networks. This is the 21st century version of that. But what's so interesting is you don't even have to declare martial law to try to control media. You, ha you hang a Damocles sword over owners, their families, uh, you threaten them with legal cases, and you can control them this way. Maria Ressa, thanks for talking to us again today. Best of luck with your case. Thanks. India's news landscape is unique. The country has almost 400 news channels broadcasting 24-7 in 22 official languages. Over the past decade, Indians have witnessed the rise of a new breed of news anchor, brash, aggressive, unapologetically nationalistic. 
They trade in conflict, fear and spectacle. It's a formula that tends to pay off in the ratings and online. A prime practitioner of this new style is Arnab Goswami of Republic TV. Goswami has an enormous following, particularly among supporters of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's BJP government. And he has plenty of critics who call his coverage of issues pertaining to Indian Muslims partisan and divisive. They say that he's abandoned journalism altogether. The Listening Post's Meenakshi Ravi now on a broadcaster who courts controversy and has pioneered an aggressive high decibel brand of nationalistic news coverage in India. You should be arrested. People like you should be arrested. You understand that? Arnab Goswami is rarely silent when there's a camera around. You know something, viewers? The Pakistanis are damn nervous today. In the daily cacophony that bombards the Indian airwaves, Goswami is among the loudest, most controversial voices. I can speak louder than you. I don't want to. You are a very senior person. I don't want to interrupt you, but you force me, I will. So it was something of an exclusive when, late last month, an Indian comedian, Kunal Kamra, tweeted a video of Arnab Goswami being uncharacteristically quiet. He's not ready to answer my question, viewers. Kamra had caught Goswami on a flight. Their interaction was not pleasant. The seatbelt signs were switched off. So I was like, now is the time I should go and confront him or talk to him or try and have a conversation with him. I tapped him and I said, Arnab, would you like to talk to me? He said, I'm on a call, I'm on a call. And then he said, he doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't want to engage with me. And then I said, but why? We are the sort of people you should engage with. And then I said, I will do exactly what his reporters do to others. Arnab, you should have a reply, Arnab. Arnab, are you a coward or are you a journalist? I invaded his privacy and I shot that video for which I am not sorry at all because he totally, totally, totally deserves it. Confronting someone in mid-air, sticking a camera in their face, peppering them with questions, is unconventional and bordering on rude. Goswami had reason to be aggrieved, except this is a tactic his own reporters use. Let's play the interview of Deepti with Tejasvi. How was the meeting? This is not a right place to talk, actually. What uh, Kunal managed to do with that one act, and I would call it a performance rather, is to bring our attention back to how utterly ugly it is. I'm not saying it wasn't unpleasant, but it was a democratic act. He was simply doing what Arnab Goswami does day in and day out. If it made even 10 people think and question how we have normalized this, and I think he's done a good job. When Arnab does his prime time show, he does scream, he does heckle. Uh, his panelists. So perhaps this time around it was, you know, tasting his own medicine. I've worked closely with Arna for the last several years and uh, thankfully he hasn't screamed at me. <laughs> Goswami is the face of Republic TV, a channel in which he holds a majority stake. His co-owner is a parliamentarian and a member of India's ruling party, the right-wing BJP. The channel was launched three years into the Modi government's first term in 2017 when Goswami told his audience what it would be getting. I am a nationalist and I want to say today that I believe that being a nationalist is a prerequisite to being a journalist. Goswami wraps himself in the flag, whether he's covering Pakistan, the Indian army. Don't you dare insinuate or any story involving Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Narendra Modi, I must say, identified with the pulse of a young India and a new India. He has a big agenda on his hands. And the Prime Minister, who hardly gives interviews and never holds press conferences, has sat down with Koswami for a one-on-one. -on -one. So the first question is that the campaign is starting. Pradhan Mantri Ji, how's the Josh? And Modi has also attended the annual events hosted by the channel, the so-called Republic Summits. Republic and Goswami are as unapologetic in their support of Modi as Fox News in the US is for its backing of Donald Trump. The relationship, however, goes back further than that. For 10 years, up until 2016, Goswami was the editor-in-chief of another channel, Times Now, where he honed his act into what it is today. 
Arnab Goswami really burst onto the scene um, during the 2008 Mumbai terror attack. I remember watching him back then when I was a journalism student. This is not an ordinary situation. This is war. And uh, this was completely new for India back then, an anchor being uh, very angry. All of us here in the media also equally tired of reporting of, about senseless after senseless incident of violence to the point where it all becomes numb. So Arnab Goswami kind of took on that space of the aggressive Fox News-ish kind of anchor. And from there on, he very successfully tapped the middle class rage or anger against politicians, against corruption. Republic TV is referred to as the Fox Network of India. But there is a large chunk of population in India that love to watch Republic TV and Arnab Goswami. So are we going to attack the entire population who watch him? Yes, there have been instances, as I said, where the reportage has been problematic. At this moment, we see a trend, unfortunately, in India where the media just goes berserk. We need to take a call and see if we need to take a back seat and just report, just report, and that's what we are here to do. We requested an interview with Arnab Goswami for this report. We were told neither he nor anyone at Republic would engage with the foreign media and their, quote, lopsided approach. That response is consistent with Goswami's frequent on-air critiques of media outlets, both in India and abroad, for their reporting on Indian issues that he dismisses as wrong-headed and weak. Goswami issues those judgments from his anchor desk. Same BBC, Madhu, which proudly lied about Kashmir. Where he baits panelists and peddles hashtags that range from the provocative to the incendiary. In the Indian media landscape, where TV is self-regulated, holding Republic or any channel to account is near impossible. In fact, last year, when the National Broadcasting Standards Association, a group comprised of representatives from Indian channels, issued an edict that Republic aired an apology for an ethics violation, the channel didn't just dismiss the order. It spearheaded the formation of a new self-regulatory body, the News Broadcasters Federation. The president of the federation is Arnab Goswami. Goswami's high decibel aggressive style has inspired many others, from Rahul Srivastava and Navika Kumar on Times Now, to Amish Devgan of News 18 and Rubika Liakat on a channel called ABP. I think what he's normalized is propaganda masquerading as journalism. Same things that he is saying on prime time is also then circulated on WhatsApp, it's circulated on social media, etc. There is a section of the public that is only receiving that and, and obviously I mean, to some extent, you can't blame them for believing that there must be some truth to it, if not the whole truth. I think what's worrying with people like Arnab Goswami is that uh, he can go on a news channel and tarnish people as anti-nationals. The despicable words and the anti-national conduct of people like Inamun Nabi on the right. Say things like, we don't need to care about human rights in Kashmir or just brand people as terrorists. Go back, get out of my country, I don't know where. We don't have democratic institutions that are going to rein in such misinformation and such hateful propaganda. And when you don't have that, you essentially have uh, journalists like this who can really color people's perception and spread mass propaganda. With politics and media increasingly polarized around the world, trolling has become the norm. TV hosts do it on the air, People do it to each other online. And an Indian comedian felt it was the only way to take on a news anchor. The consequences of trolling aren't felt equally, though. For Kunal Kamra, the pushback to his ambush of Goswami was led by the country's Minister of Aviation. His tweet commending one Indian airline for putting Kamra on a six-month no-fly list resulted in three other airlines following suit. For Kamra, though, the focus of the entire incident remains Arnab Goswami. All I know is that when you watch this man, he puts a good theatre show up. So he soaks you in and he entertains you very well and he polarises you very well. And that polarisation is leaving the TV sets and it's going to the streets. So realise what you are instigating. Realise what you are getting to the table and realise how it's impacting lives. Don't open your mouth. Why? Quiet. Who are you? Because you've spoken Who too much. Who are you?